Good morning and thanks for joining us online today for worship. Beginning today, October 4th, we will be offering an online Bible class Sunday evenings at 6 p.m. Join us for a communal study on Revelation led by Tyler Carmichael and Ray Patton. The class will meet via Zoom and you can find the login information on our Facebook page. Coming up October 23rd through the 25th is the Fall Youth Retreat on the Buffalo River. The retreat is open to 7th through 12th graders and costs $50 a person. Deadline for sign up is October 19th. Contact Andy Brazel with any questions. We are excited to announce that we have finalized plans for Memorial Garden honoring Mackie Chestnut. We are currently in the fundraising portion of the project and our goal is to raise $7,000. If you'd like to contribute towards Mackie's Memorial Garden, you can give online at scocrogers.com or make checks payable to Southside Church of Christ in Earmark Chestnut Garden. Thanks again for joining us today. There's this much time until worship starts. We're excited to worship with you. We shall assemble on the mountain, we shall assemble at the throne, with humble hearts into his presence, we bring an offering of song. things 
Kings be my life and bread. I want what you want, Lord, and nothing less. When you don't move the mountains, I'm needing you to move. When you don't part the waters, I wish I could walk through. When you don't give the answers, as I cry out to you, I will trust, I will trust, I will trust in you. I will trust in you. You are my strength and comfort. You are my steady hand. You are my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand. Your ways are always higher. Your plans are always good. There's not a place where I'll go. You've not already stood. When you don't move the mountains, I'm needing you to move. When you don't part the waters, I wish I could walk through. When you don't give me answers, as I cry out to you, I will trust, I will trust, I will trust in you. I will trust in you. I will trust in you. In heavenly armor we'll enter the land. The battle belongs to the Lord. No weapon that's fashioned against us will stand. The battle belongs to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, power and strength to the Lord. We sing glory, honor, power and strength to the Lord. When the power of darkness comes in like a flood, the battle belongs to the Lord. He's raised up a standard, the power of his blood, the battle belongs to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, power and strength to the Lord. We sing glory, honor, power and strength to the Lord. When your enemy passes in heart, do not fear, the battle belongs to the Lord. Take courage, my friend, your redemption is near, the battle belongs to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, power and strength to the Lord.
Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us for our online worship service this morning. Wherever you are, I hope you know that the presence of God is there with you. And even though we can't be together face to face right now, I hope you know that we are so glad that we can connect like this. I'm glad you're here today. This morning, we're starting a new series on baptism. And as I've prepared for this series, I've been reflecting on my own baptism. I'll always remember that Wednesday night where I chose to be baptized. I was reading a book called The Purpose Driven Life. I'm sure many of you have read it. I came home from school that Wednesday afternoon, opened up that book for the very first time, and read the very first line, which was simply, it's not about you. And I'm not sure why, but that one sentence opened up something in me. And I went directly from my room to find my mom in the other room and told her, I, I'm ready to be baptized. I, I want to be baptized tonight. And so I, I went to church that night, spent the evening with the youth group. And then after church was over, the youth group and, and many others who had gathered there on Wednesday night went to the auditorium and I climbed the stairs up to our baptistry and, and got ready with my dad. I remember my dad praying over me and the only words that he could get out before he got choked up were, Father, bless my son. And, and then together we went down into the waters and I was there surrounded by my best friends who gathered with me up in the baptistry while while everyone else watched below. My dad baptized me in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He told me that I would receive forgiveness for my sins and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Those same words that so many of us have heard at our own baptisms as well. And then afterwards, I, I came up and I, I heard the singing. There was a tradition at my church growing up that but any, anytime anyone was baptized, they sang, Arise, my love. So I heard the singing. And then we went downstairs, got dried off, and went downstairs. And I circled up with, with the church gathered there. And again, they sang over me. And I took communion for the first time. And I remember telling one of the ministers, who's a close friend and a mentor, about how overwhelmed I felt. Looking back, it's not that dissimilar from the same feelings I've had at, like at my wedding or the birth of my children. It's a moment that you recognize that is so full of meaning, but you almost don't have emotions or even words to capture it. And so you're just kind of there, awestruck. I remember expressing that to this minister. And I remember him telling me that, well, that's the first dose of the Holy Spirit. I cherish those memories. And as I look back, one of the things that strikes me is how simple the act of baptism is. I know one church that, in describing what baptism is for outsiders, has simply wrote, baptism is getting dunked in water. And on one level, that's true. It's that simple of an act. It's, it's something that many of us have experienced over and over again in swimming pools or bathtubs. It's getting dunked in water. And yet, it's more than that as well. It's something... It's so rich and full of meaning passed down to us from the first century in those writings of the New Testament to today, through 2,000 years of Christian history. It's something sacred. It's something which connects us in a unique way to God. It's something essential for the Christian walk. Yes, you're getting dunked in water, but it's so much more than that. And so we're starting this new series on baptism called Made New. 
And each of these, each of the four weeks in this series, we're going to take a look at the ways in which baptism invites us into the newness that God has for us. Baptism initiates us into being made new. And today we're going to explore what it means to have new life. And that's one of the promises of baptism, is that when we are baptized and we come out of the water, we're, we're being initiated, invited into, and experiencing new life. And so I thought it would f be fitting for us to start with maybe the classic passage on baptism, Romans chapter 6. I invite you to open up your Bibles if you have them, or you can watch along on the screen. This is Romans chapter 6. Where's the Apostle Paul? What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that cr grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with. But we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God in the same way. Count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life. And offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master, because you are no longer under the law, but under grace. Like I said, it's, it's a classic passage on baptism. And Paul opens it up with this rhetorical question. Well, what then? Should we just continue sinning so that grace may increase? He's following up on the logic that he started in, in Romans chapter 5. This idea that, well, if we're all good and we're under grace now, then what's to stop us from just living a sinful life? Grace has us covered, doesn't it? And Romans chapter 6 is his attempt to deconstruct that way of thinking. And I, I really appreciate the way the NRSV translates the very beginning of Romans chapter 6. It translates it this way. What then are we to say? Should we continue in sin in order that grace may abound by no means? How can we who died to sin go on living in it? So it the key there is that preposition that he chose, that the translators chose, in sin. How can we continue living in sin? It's as if sin is, is a location. It's, it's less an act that we choose to do and, and more of a domain that we live inside of. And Paul is saying, you don't live in under the domain of sin anymore. You've, you've left that country. You've left the country of sin and death, and, and, and now you live in a different country. That's what's happening at our baptisms, that we're departing the country of sin and death and entering the country of life. For me, I think about leaving Texas. I left the country of Texas, the state of Texas, to come and move to Arkansas and 
When I did that, I had to leave behind my Texan ways. When we moved here, I had to give up my taste for beef brisket and settle instead for pork barbecue, a much inferior form of barbecue. But that's what was required of me to make this move from the state of Texas to the state of Arkansas. And of course, there's a lot of other parallels. We had to change our license plates and our licenses. We changed our address and forwarded our mail. There was so many different things that we had to do, all these details that went with moving from one state to another. And, and that's what Paul is imagining for us when he talks about sin in this way. That at our baptisms, we've, less, we've left the domain, the state of sin and death, and have come into the state of life. Because when we're baptized, we put off our old self, to use Paul's language. Our old self that is committed to the ways of sin and death, we shed that off. And when we do that, we forfeit our citizenship. We no longer belong in the country of sin and death, the kingdom of sin and death. And instead, we trade it for a citizen, citizenship, the kingdom of life. And what's interesting is this is, this is always how Christians have talked about baptism. And this isn't the only place Paul talks about baptism this way. He also mentions this in Colossians chapter 3. In Ephesians chapter 4, it's the shedding off of the old self and putting on a new self. And when we do that, we don't belong in the same place anymore. We've left the country that we used to know. It's a country we wanted to leave because it was, it was a place that led to death. But now, but now we're in green pastures. Now we're where the living waters are. We're in the land of the living. And even right after the New Testament was finished, this is how Christians taught about baptism. One of the very earliest documents we have right outside the New Testament is something called the Didache, or the teachings of the Twelve Apostles. And it's this document that the early church put together to teach those who wanted to be baptized. Those who had come to the church, they have seen this other way, and they wanted to commit themselves to it as well. And before, before they were allowed to get baptized, the church said, okay, you've, you've, we've got to teach you a few things. And, and the Didache is their, what they wrote down to pass on to these people who, who wanted to be baptized. And in the very first line of this Didache, of this teaching to those who want to be baptized is this. It opens up with, with this, there are two ways, one of life and one of death. And there is a great difference between the two ways. And then it goes on, the way of life is this, first, you shall love God who made you. And second, love your neighbor as, your, as yourself and do not do to another what you would not want done to you. And it spins the next four chapters, going over exactly what that means. What does it mean to love God? What does it mean to love your neighbor? It gets into the nitty-gritty details. This is how you are supposed to live if you choose the way of life. And then it describes the way of death. And it's like a topographic, topographical map of the kingdom of death. It explores every nook and cranny so that nothing remains uncovered. It's a satellite image of the country of death. It sounds like this. It describes the way of death. The way of death, on the other hand, is this. It is evil and accursed. Murders, adulteries, lust, illicit sex, thefts, idolatries, magical arts, sorceries, robberies, false testimonies, hypocrisy, double-heartedness, deceit, haughtiness, depravity, self-will, greediness, filthy talking, jealousy, overconfidence, loftiness, boastfulness, those who do not fear God. 
The way of death is the way of those who persecute the good, hate the truth, love lies, and do not understand the reward for righteousness. They do not cleave to good or righteous judgment. They do not watch for what is good, but what, but what is evil. They are strangers to meekness and patience, loving vanities, pursuing revenge, without pity for the needy and the oppressed. They do not know their creator. They are murderers of children, both born and unborn, destroyers of God's image. They turn away from those who are in need, making matters worse for those who are distressed. They are advocates for the rich, unjust judges of the poor. In a word, the way of death is full of those who are steeped in sin. Be delivered, children, from all of this. That's the way the early church described the kingdom of death. For those who wanted to be baptized, it said this this is what you must leave behind. This is the old self that you find yourself held in captivity to. And this is exactly what's being stripped away the moment you go down into those waters, dying the same death as Christ and being raised into new life to walk in the newness that Jesus taught us to embrace. And that's why just a century or two later, one of the early church fathers, Tertullian, said that if you really want to understand what's going on at baptism, what you really have got to reflect on is the story of Exodus. Because here you have the story of Israel being saved through water. They're escaping a kingdom, a kingdom run by Pharaoh that has enslaved them. But by the power of God, the waters part and they walk through those water, waters to the other side. And just as the chariots of Pharaoh are chasing them, the waters collapse over them, destroying them all. And in that moment, the power of Pharaoh, the kingdom of death, Egypt, no longer has any power over them. They've escaped by making this journey through the water. And now they're headed to the promised land. A new life. And Tertullian says that's exactly what's happening at our baptisms. We're, we're making our escape. The same way the Israelites made their escape through those waters. We make our escape through the water of baptism. And all the chariots that are chasing us to bring us death, are drowned in those waters so that we might walk in a different way, that we might experience new life. I think it's exactly what's happening in this cartoon I want to share with you by um, a cartoonist named Daniel Erlander. That it's this picture of Israel in the wilderness. They're in the wilderness school. And you see on either side, there are these two signs. One says to Egypt and the other says to the promised land. And that's exactly where we find ourselves once we've, we've come up out of the waters. Egypt, the domain of death and sin, has, has lost its control over us. But but we're still in this place where we have to learn how to live. There's always that fork in the road. Do we turn back towards Egypt? Or do we make the turn towards the promised land, to the way of life? And I love the two gophers there in the corner. They have to be taught how to live? Well, they're only human. And that's what Jesus has given us. He's, he's given us a way to live. He's shown us the way to life. That's what he says in John chapter 10. I've come that you might have life to the fullest. And baptism is our embrace of that life. As we escape through the waters, all of the shackles that death had around us, so that we might choose the way of Jesus. So my mom worked at the church 
uh, building for a while as a secretary, which meant my brother and I were up at the church building a lot. And a lot of the times you might find us playing basketball in the gym or playing foosball in the youth room. But sometimes I would sneak over to the church library and I would just peruse the books there. And I'll always remember finding one book in particular. It's the book, The Cost of Discipleship by Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And I have to admit, maybe I need to repent. This is the actual copy from that library. As it turns out, I, I owe my home church $1.45. I, I took this with me because as I read it, as a teenager, I found in it a kind of Christianity that made me long for Jesus, a kind of Christianity that I found compelling. I had so many questions, but, but opening up these pages and reading just the first few lines, I, I thought, okay, I, I found a Christianity that, that I can believe in. I found a form of faith that I want to give my life to. I want to share part of this book with you today because Bonhoeffer's opening statements are exactly in line with what Paul's concerned with in Romans chapter 6. Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? Bonhoeffer looked at the church of his day in 1930s Germany, right before the rise of the Nazi party. And he saw the same problem, this assumption that if, well, if we're under grace, then we can just get to live however we want. And he was convinced, well, no, you've, you've misunderstood your baptism. If that's the version of Christianity you want to buy into. And so he, he opens this book like this. Cheap grace is the deadly enemy of the church, of our church. We are fighting today for costly grace. And then he continues, cheap grace means the justification of sin without the justification of the sinner. Grace alone does everything, they say, and so everything can remain as it was before. Let the Christian live like the rest of the world. That is what we mean by cheap grace, the grace which amounts to the justification of sin without the justification of the repentant sinner who departs from sin and from whom sin departs. It's that language of Exodus there again. We're departing the country, the land, the kingdom of sin, and that kingdom is departing from us. And then he compares that cheap grace the very thing that Paul is warning us about in Romans chapter 6 with, with what he calls costly grace. This is how he describes it. Costly grace is the treasure hidden in the field. For the sake of it, a man will gladly go and sell all that he has. It's the pearl of great price to buy which the merchant will sell all his goods. It's the kingly rule of Christ for whose sake a man will pluck out the eye which causes him to stumble. It's the call of Jesus Christ at which the disciple leaves his nets and follows him. Such grace is costly because it calls us to follow. And it's grace because it calls us to follow Jesus Christ. It's costly because it costs a man his life. And it's grace because it gives a man the only true life. At our baptisms, we're experiencing exactly what Bonhoeffer has described here, what Paul has described in Romans 6. We are departing sin. We are leaving the place where sin reigns, and we are entering into a new life in the kingdom of of life over which Christ rules and having done so we adopt the way of Christ 
having shed all the practices of sin and death. Practice the way of Jesus. Because it's in practicing those things we have learned that, that life in its fullest is available to us. All of this flowing to us through the power of the death and resurrection of Jesus. I'm in the way, the bright and shining way. I'm in the glory land, glory land way. Telling the world that Jesus saves today. Yes, I'm in the glory land, glory land way. I'm in the glory land, glory land way. I'm in the glory land, glory land way. Heaven is nearer and the way grow with clearer forth. I'm in the glory land, glory land way. Listen to the call, the gospel call today. Get in the glory land, glory land way. Wanderers come home, oh, hasten to obey. For I'm in the glory land, glory land. I'm in the glory land, glory land way. Heaven is nearer and the way grow with clearer for. I'm in the glory land, glory land way. Onward I go rejoicing in his love. I'm in the glory land, glory land way. Soon I shall see him in that home above. For I'm in the glory land, glory land in the glory land, glory land way. I'm in the glory land, glory land way. Heaven is nearer and the way grow with clearer form. I'm in the glory